Hello, everybody. This is a Formula One podcast where we bring our cold, bare hands to the velvet gloved world of Formula One racing. My name is Nolan Sykes. I'm joined by my two co hosts. We've got over in Texas, we got motorsport journalist Elizabeth Blackstock. Hello, hello. And reporting to us live from an undisclosed location in Mexico, Alanis King. Hello, that is me. <laughs> Are you at a, a timeshare vacation right now? Okay, so this resort is a timeshare, but also just a regular resort. They try to sell you a timeshare while you're here, yes. but you can just say no. Like you don't have to listen to any of the sales pitches. And we've never <laughs> listened to them before, but this time we were like, you know what? We're not going to do it, but I am curious what it's about. And like, maybe there is some sort of deal here. Like maybe there's a reason all these people do this. Let's listen mm -hmm. to it. So stay strong. Don't give in. Keep getting that. Must Get those massage coupons. Absolutely. I, first of all, Alanis, I, I, th I thank you for your dedication to the show. Uh, recording from your vacation. Yes, absolutely, Nolan. You know, so I go to the airport last week and I had this giant podcast microphone in my backpack, right? <laughs> yes. And I put it through TSA. I put it through the little x-ray machines. And of course it gets pulled over to the side. And I'm like, dang it, dang it, dang it. Don't take my microphone. Like, you know, this thing is big and heavy and it could probably be used as a weapon. Like, don't take it uh -huh. from me. Uh -huh. I've already checked my bag. Um, and they just kind of like pick it up and they look at it and they're like, yeah, all right. I don't think she's going to kill anybody with that. And then they just put it back. And I was like, okay. We're good. And so I brought it in my backpack to this resort <laughs> and I'm here. I'm looking at the ocean right now out my window and I'm sitting in a hotel room with a microphone talking Lovely. about Formula One. So it's wonderful. But in today's episode, we are talking about the Belgian Grand Prix at That's Spa. Right. But first, we're back from summer break, except for me, who's still on summer you break. You are still I on summer break. <laughs> I would like to hear how Nolan and Elizabeth spent their summer break. <laughs> um, <laughs> let's see. I, I went out to the Bonneville Salt Flats a few weeks ago, and it got completely rained out. So wow. did not get to drive on the flats, unfortunately. Uh, we did roll our car out of the trailer once, and it was awesome. Uh, wow. But it was so rainy out there. Yeah, I was uh, I was completely surprised by how it, I had never seen that much rain in such a short amount of time. The day before it rained out, there's a storm that just rolled through. I think it dumped about a foot of water over Jesus. on on Wendover. Oh. Um, yeah. So, you know, wake up the next morning and I wasn't expecting to run that day because it had rained. And, you know, at that point, we had been there for two or three days constantly getting rained out. So I was like, okay, we'll just have to wait until later on in the week. And they called it off and it's like, okay, that sucks. Let's go get the trailer. So we go out to the salt flats and there's just a, yeah, there's like a foot of water just st standing oh. where the, where the salt lake used to be. It turned back into a lake, I guess. And uh, <laughs> it, it sucked. I, I really wish we could have gotten to drive. I feel like now I'm like trying to make up for the lost adrenaline. Like I'm trying, I'm like, <laughs> I'm doing all these other things now uh, to make up. Now? I, I, I would, I would do that. Uh, but anyway, it was cool to, it was cool to see that much water. Like, I feel like that is kind of like a once in a lifetime thing to see that hopefully. Um, so that kind of made up for it, but otherwise disappointed, but that's, that's kind of how I spent my break. Elizabeth. Uh, I went to Nashville for IndyCar um, and also got rained on a lot. I introduced a British man to Tennessee, wow. which was delightful. He asked if Twisted Tea has milk in it. <laughs> what? Uh, oh. which, and it's like that was like the highlight, oh. I think, of my, my summer break. Yeah. Oh, so that, it was fun. It was a good time. Oh, I was wow. mostly a fan. Uh, and then I got home and I haven't done anything since other than do work. That's which true. Wow. Equally exciting. I went to the Long Beach Grand Prix earlier this year and I had a Lamborghini Huracan STO and I took a British man to Chili's in the Lamborghini. <laughs> of course. Be because I forgot about that. He asked to go to Chili's and I was just like, I just need you to know that you asked. I did not push this on you. I'm not making a sales pitch. I am not selling you a timeshare to Chili's. Like you asked. And we go to Chili's and they have like two people working and it took like three hours to get our food and they didn't bring us like any toppings or anything like that. And he was just like, 
this is one of the weirdest experiences I've ever had in my life. And I was like, thank you so much. Let's go get back in the Lamborghini. And we went and we got back in the Lamborghini and we left Chili's. Alanis, if if <laughs> if Chili's offered some sort of timeshare program, uh, perhaps where you get your table, you have your table reserved only for you for like one day of the month. Would you guys partake in that? It would have to be like every other week, not one day of the month, like every other week timeshare at Chili's. I would love that. You get free appetizers in, included. Exactly. Yeah. I, I'd be all over it. One of the weird things they tell you um, when you're in this like sales pitch is like, would you rather rent a home or own a home? And I'm like, buddy, that this is not the same thing. Like, this is a <laughs> hotel room. <laughs> like, this isn't renting a home versus owning a home. Like that is not the argument. <laughs> Good Lord. And so I did not fall for it. But if Chili's said, would you rather rent a Chili's or own a Chili's? Uh, I'd fall for it. So right. we'll use our business connections to reach out to the Chili's marketing team and uh, try to get you, you know, some sort of timeshare situation. Thank you so much, Nolan. Here's my transition into the topic of the show. You know, we we had some events go over summer break, but we weren't the only ones. Some drivers had some events happen to them, too. <laughs> Good old Daniel Ricardo, our... American superhero from Australia is actually leaving McLaren a year earlier than intended. Um, his three-year contract is now a two-year contract, which means that he is currently going to be done with the team at the end of this season. It's not really a surprise. It's kind of a surprise if you think about from the, the perspective of it cost a lot of money to buy him out of this contract. Mm -hmm. Allegedly, McLaren paid Daniel $15 million to end this contract early. He got $15 million to not race in Formula One. Um, what about he's me? Allowed to race. Yeah, that's kind of what I'm saying. Like, I, I already don't race. Yeah. <laughs> you should be rewarding me. The, this. this is what I'm saying. Listen, um, anybody out there, Zach Brown, Christian Horner, if you just pay me like $1 million, I will stop asking to race for your team. <laughs> Zach Brown, if you pay me a million dollars, I will get a logo of McLaren tattooed on my body and not race. But where on your cars. body, Elizabeth? You have to specify. Full chest. Full chest. Full chest. Wow. I, I thought yeah. you were going to get like a McLaren ass tattoo. Like just. You know, I but people need to see it. That's the problem. Oh, that's I don't true. I don't frequently take my pants off on the internet. So you're so not Valtteri Botas is what you're telling me. I am not Valtteri, unfortunately. Ooh, that's that's good real estate for my him to sell. My tan lines are about as bad, though. Oh, you know, I think I've been kind of hard on Daniel the past couple of years. Um, you know, he's, he, but he, he hasn't been good for a couple of yeah, years. Yeah. I mean, his performance has been <laughs> underwhelming to say the least, but I, I also feel bad that, uh, it's ending at McLaren so soon. It just didn't never clicked for him. Unfortunately, not that the possibility of him not coming back is on the table. I don't want that to happen. I want him to stay yeah. in the sport. I think he's great for the sport. People love him. I love him. Like he's a really cool dude. And when he's in the right car, he's an amazing driver. So I want to see him come back. I don't know which team it'll be for, but you know, my fingers are fingers and toes are crossed for, for <laughs> Danny Rick here. Wow. Yeah. Nolan, that's a lot of crossing there. Yeah. I mean, I think it's important to say that like Daniel Ricardo, he hasn't been that bad at McLaren. Like these, these past few weeks, this, this year, the results have been not good, but we're forgetting that just recently he got the first the team's first win in like 10 years. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, his performance has been spotty, but I think it's important to talk about the fact that Daniel Ricardo took a really, really big risk on his career when he left Red Bull mm -hmm. to make sure he didn't get promoted and demoted constantly, depending on what Red Bull wanted for Max Verstappen. That's a good point. I mean, that does, that does warrant a lot of respect. Like you're in a position where you're with prospectively. I, it wasn't the best team at the time, but you're with a team that has a history of being very successful and he took a bet on himself and it hasn't really worked out so far. But, you know, he recently said that he looks at, you know, Sergio Perez's career and how Sergio like kind of bounced back from a tumultuous kind of time. And now he's on a top team and he, Daniel thinks that he can do the same thing with himself. And I think that's totally possible. You know, all it takes is for one manufacturer or one team to have a good car and for Daniel to pair with that. And he's going to be right back on track. I completely agree on those lines of strange contract situations. We also have Oscar Piastri 
uh, who was 2021's Formula 2 champion. He's probably going to be McLaren's next driver for next year. Um, <laughs> Maybe. We'll see. We're not probably. sure. <laughs> Alpine technically announced him as their driver after Fernando Alonso said that he was leaving. Um, and then Piastri was like, actually, no, uh, I am not. I'm not doing that. So it's part of a really weird series of misunderstandings about driver contracts that have been going on this year, starting with Alex Palou and IndyCar. He got announced to the Chip Ganassi Racing Team before then announcing, actually, I'm going to McLaren. So everyone is racing for McLaren this year. Except Daniel Ricciardo. Except Daniel Ricciardo, which has to hurt. Ouch. As we speak, uh, it's Monday. Piastri is going before the Contract Recognition Board to see exactly the details of his situation, if he's allowed to go to McLaren. That's been quite the saga to be following. And the great part about that was that Alex Albon kind of did the copy pasta of Piastri's I'm not staying with Alpine, mm-hmm. but to announce actually I'm staying with Williams. It, it was good. I appreciate a good good driver meme. The social media game of these drivers has gotten so good the past couple of years, like, ten, you know, five mm-hmm. years ago, it was like non-existent. But now yes. <laughs> it's off the hook. It's great. It's so good. I remember when the pinnacle of social media for Formula One was one team responding to another team's tweet. Yes. That was like, oh, my God, look, they have personalities. And it wasn't actually like personalities. It was just one person responding to stuff. So <laughs> God, Formula One under Bernie Ecclestone, who is a former CEO um, under him, Formula One was just like this. This like forbidden castle with a bunch of gates around it, like, and you just got locked outside of it. And I remember Lewis Hamilton and like, I oh, it was like 2016. Lewis Hamilton got on Snapchat and he was like mm-hmm. posting from press conferences and putting like dog filters over people. Uh-huh. And Bernie Ecclestone was pissed. Bernie Ecclestone <laughs> was like, "You will not Snapchat in my garage." And then Lewis was like, "All right." And then he went and Snapchatted from the garage. <laughs> <laughs> and so you'd like get in trouble. And now we're finally like getting some social media. And with that, we're getting all these thirst traps. We're getting Valtteri <laughs> Botas's butt. Like what more could you want? Just those two <laughs> things. Ex- like, this is what I'm saying. If you would have told me like six years ago that I have seen most of Valtteri Botas's naked body, <laughs> I'd be like, <laughs> what <laughs> i'm sorry excuse me and like this man just keeps going like it's fantastic good for him i think he should open an only fans like oh. i think o- he only could fins be... only fans. <laughs> oh, that's awful <laughs> oh no he could use that to fund his next career move he could just sponsor himself. That's fantastic. Look, I, I think that's a great idea. Uh, if you would have given me like a lineup to choose from, like which Formula One driver have I seen naked on the Internet? It would definitely be Daniel Ricardo. And at this point, like <laughs> maybe Daniel Ricardo needs to think about that because he doesn't have a team maybe for people, next year. Maybe McLaren would have kept him if he had gotten naked on the Internet. Before. I'm just saying like Valtteri currently has a car, you know, like sometimes it works. OK. Everything I've learned about Valtteri Bottas's body has been against my will. It has been completely against my will. Like, I did not ask for any of this. And yet, and yet, when he sold a poster of his ass, I bought it. We also have my husband who won't let me hang it. I'm so sorry. Speaking of social media and drivers being good at it, uh, Alex Albon did a Reddit Ask Me Anything and... It was honestly, like, the answers he gave were incredible. I somehow missed Um, this. It was so funny. I'm on it right now, and the top question asked was, hey, Alex, what's your favorite shirtless picture of George? Amazing. (laughs) Yep. And then he says, obviously, no shirtless picture of George is good. I was pretty surprised with this last photo. He somehow managed to make it look like he needed to undo his buttons playing croquet. Who knew croquet was so (laughs) physical? Okay, wait a second. I have not seen this one. Um, so if you will, oh, so if you will give me a moment, um, I'm gonna live react to seeing this photo. Let me turn up the brightness on my phone all the way. I see a photo in the gym. Where's oh 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 oh? <laughs> okay, okay. Oh. A lot of oh my god, too much owing over there. Why is he swung the mallet behind Whoa. his back? 
like he looks like he's itching his back with the mallet. Um, he's looking he's looking trim though. He's looking in shape. Yeah, I don't know why you would have to unbutton your shirt unless this is like a resort kind of setting. I don't think he's actually playing croquet. I think someone gave him a stick and said, hold this stick and like drape it behind your back. I think this is confusing art direction. Oh, Alex (laughs) Albon has commented on this photo. It's like Um, a Ralph Lauren polo (laughs) kind of like photo shoot that's going on. So Alex Albon has weighed in on the photo itself and said, there's shirtless and then there's wearing a shirt shirtless. I don't know if I'm (laughs) impressed or disappointed. So good. He seems like a cool dude. I like him. He seems like a nice boy. At one point in this AMA, someone also asked Alban if he would rather fight a horse-sized Lando or 100 duck-sized Georges. (laughs) Um, And his Alban's argument for why he would pick a horse-sized Lando is that Lando is already the size of a Shetland pony, so he'd basically just be fighting Lando as he currently is. <laughs> you know what? I think that's I think that's a wonderful mm. answer, but I think it would be interesting if you were just approached by 100 duck-sized George Russells. Like it would be pretty great. I think that would be very interesting. Yeah, you could sell them as pets. You could sell them to Alex Elvon's mom. <laughs> and then she could post about them on Instagram. <laughs> I think we just refuted his answer here. I think you got to go 100 duck sized Georges. You, that's a lucrative business. Mm-hmm. It really is. <laughs> so let's move on to uh, just news from the summer break, the everything. There's a lot has happened since we last talked. Yeah, so we got to catch up. Formula One boss Stefano Domenicali has said there will be no more racing in Russia. I'm curious what y'all think about this, because I think it is very easy to say this stuff when big world events happen. And then 10 years later go, oh, Russia's better now. We're going. And then you just completely erase your comment. Like he was very forceful about it. He said these things sometimes change, but this will not change. I think they're going to do whatever the money tells them to do. Yes. Yeah. How long is Stefano Domenicali going to be in charge? Who's going to take over next? And what are their business interests going to be? If you take over, then yeah, we're probably not going to have any more racing in Russia. But if it's someone else, some other strange white man, uh, I presume we will be back in Russia. They really wanted a race in St. Petersburg. um, And I don't think they're going to scrap those plans necessarily. I think they're just going to wait for it to become a better deal. I'm willing to bet like my entire savings that the next person who runs Formula One will be some random white man. (laughs) In addition to that, German manufacturer Audi will join the Formula One World Championship from the 2026 season as a power unit supplier. This is due to new power unit regulations for that year. Uh, They'll maintain the current V6 engine, but feature more electrified power and 100% sustainable fuels, which sounds really great, but most people probably have no idea what that means. Yeah. So currently, I mean, the cars are hybrids. We know this, uh, but for the next iteration of the power unit, so that's the engine and hybrid system, just overall is called a power unit, 45% of the horsepower is going to be coming from that hybrid system. So a huge increase. Um, The cars are going to sound a lot different. I think they're probably going to accelerate a lot faster if they're going to be using a lot more uh, electrical energy to spin those wheels. And of course, with an increased emphasis on the hybrid drivetrain, that makes it more enticing for more manufacturers such as Audi to enter the ring Porsche is waiting in the wings still where there's like kind of confirmation, but not really that they're going to be involved. Like, I feel like last episode, we talked about how Porsche bought 50% of Red Bull technology. Mm -hmm. Right. And then I read a a tweet this morning from an F1 journalist that it hasn't even been signed yet. So we'll see what happens, I guess. But, you know, we do have confirmation of Audi, which is part of the Volkswagen auto group that includes Porsche. So that also complicates things. So we'll see where this goes. Yeah. So um, Audi was intrigued by the 2026 regulations, which are part of F1's plans to be more sustainable and cost efficient. Because when I think about Formula One, I think about <laughs> sustainability and cost efficiency. That is where I am putting my 401k. And so, yeah, <laughs> Porsche is also rumored to be joining. But Audi has said 
they will not share a power unit program despite both being Volkswagen owned brands. Because if you don't know, pretty much everything is owned by Volkswagen. Bugatti, <laughs> Audi, all these different brands, like everybody's under Volkswagen. So you'd think they were going to share this power unit program, but apparently they're not. And I I think that's probably just a uh, misplaced ego because yeah. if I had two brands, I would <laughs> share my power unit development. I'd be like, okay, you guys can call them different things, but to save money because we're a freaking business, you guys got to develop them together. I don't, you know. Well, what's fascinating yeah. is you announce this and you're like, yes, we support Formula One's plans to be more sustainable and cost efficient, but. We're going to develop two different power units, which is not sustainable or cost efficient. Yeah, like, I, what? Especially after Audi has previously said this year that it's going to stop building combustion engines entirely, which means that this development of this power unit is not focusing kind of on things that it's going to be translating into its road cars. I think this is an extremely sustainable and cost efficient plan. And I think any of your criticisms of it are completely uninformed because you are not the CEO of Audi. I do, I'm just not privy to those kinds of economic decisions. <laughs> well, tell me, tell me more about Andretti. What's Andretti getting up to? Oh, Andretti. So my dear friends, the, the Andretti team, um, Michael Andretti, who is really wonderful. Earlier this year, I was making his race car drivers do cartwheels like on command and he forced them to do it. And so shout out to Michael Andretti. I appreciate you a lot. Thank you for that. Anyway, Michael Andretti, he wants to join Formula One. And I would really love if he did, because then I would be able to get Formula One drivers to do cartwheels on command. So I support you, my guy. So we learned in February that he formally applied to have a team on the grid beginning with the 2024 season. Current teams are not super thrilled about this, most of them, because when you have a pool of people competing in a championship, your prize money gets diluted between that pool. If we currently have 10 Formula One teams and we add an 11th, that means that prize money will be diluted among 11 teams. So there are two columns of prize money. The first one is distributed equally among all teams. So that's 35 million per team. And the second column has been limited to the top 10 traditionally based on their points throughout that they've scored throughout the season. Ooh, ouch. Mm. Yeah. So that, that 11th team would Williams. Yeah. It, it's it probably be Williams. It, <laughs> it could theoretically be a team that's currently on the grid. It doesn't make sense for um, like a, a, you, you wouldn't want another team to come in and like do a Haas and be pretty good right out of the gate. And with Andretti's resources, that could possibly happen. And Andretti's resources include cartwheels. So Andretti, <laughs> I'm pulling for you. Um, I hope to see you on the Formula One grid. So when a new team joins, if these if these other teams allow it and Formula One allows it, this new team will pay kind of a penalty, which is a penalty for the dilution of the prize pool that will be dispersed among the current teams to make up for the fact that they will get less prize money because we're dividing it between 11 teams. So lots of complicated stuff going on here. But overall, a second American team is considered good for the growth of Formula One's popularity, because if you haven't noticed, Formula One is getting very big in America. We are going from one race to three. It's a lot. You know, we need another American team. It would be ideal to have an American driver. So in Miami, which was the second American race on the Formula One calendar, which got added this year, my buddy Michael Andretti visited with pretty much all the team leaders, except for Toto Wolff, who is the boss of Mercedes. Because Toto has been in the opposition to this 11th team for a long time. He wants a strong business case to add somebody due to the dilution of prize money, everything like that. Michael Andretti wanted to get all the team leaders to sign a letter in support of an 11th team joining the grid. Uh, he got Zach Brown, who's the head of McLaren, and he got the Alpine CEO. But they both have big business prospects with Andretti because Zach Brown has connections to the Andretti drivers and Alpine would perhaps work with Andretti on power units if they joined. So uh, not super successful. All right. Well, with those news items out of the way, let's talk about the race weekend that we all watched. It's the Belgian Grand Prix. Formula One finally confirmed that the track is going to be part of the 2023 calendar. The 
Spa Grand Prix has been kind of up in the air for a little while. It was one of the races that was thinking about being scrapped in favor of new events like Las Vegas. So the fate has been up in the air for a while. It will at least be here one more year. So let's talk about the circuit itself in our newly titled segment, Track Walk. The race at Spa is 44 laps long, and Spa itself is the longest track on the current calendar. It's about 7 kilometers or 4.35 miles. It was originally built in 1921. Uh, It was twice as long back then and incorporated public roads around the circuit. Uh, The track was one of seven to be part of F1's first official championship in 1950 and was rebuilt in 1979 as well as made shorter. There is also a recent 80 million euro overhaul of the venue to improve safety. Yeah, there's been a lot of bad accidents there recently, so they had to improve it. And I think that was part of the bid to keep it on the calendar. It's currently a mix of long straights and 19 fast corners. And because the track is so long and Belgian weather is really fickle, it can actually be raining on one side of the circuit and dry on the other, which throws in a lot of strategy when it comes to a weather related race, which we did not have this year. Uh, But we definitely did last year when the race ran for two laps behind a safety car and then was immediately red flagged. Yeah. How do you guys feel about the track? I'm, I'm hit or miss with spa and like this. I wasn't like going to be sad if it didn't come back. But at the same time, I really like the history of motorsport. So it's really neat. Like it's a gorgeous track. The layout is incredible. Um, And we've had this like recent shift to these purpose built Tilke drums, which are the tracks made by designer Herman Tilke, which are basically you think of like Circuit of the Americas. That's a Mm -hmm. track that's just cobbled together from the best parts of tracks around the world with like very little concern as to how those things will play out in into each other. So I was going to be sad if it was gone, but I also wasn't going to like totally miss it, if that makes sense. I feel like Spa is a track that keeps a lot of people interested because of its layout. Like its landscape dictated the track, which I think is awesome. And, you know, me personally, like it is my favorite track on the calendar Uh, I love driving it in like driving games and Sims and stuff. But like when it actually comes to racing, the last few years, I don't think I've been particularly exciting. So I get why it was kind of on the chopping block for a while, because the product overall was not super great. And, you know, it's been on the calendar for such a long time. And the, the legacy is what people really love about it. Yeah, I respect that take. It's it's the same way I feel about Monaco, where I appreciate mm-hmm. and respect the history, but it's I so disagree. Boring. Yeah, I, I don't. It, it's <laughs> not a good race anymore. Like, I'm all here for Monaco being a non points paying exhibition race so we can keep it on the calendar and like award something for it. But keeping it as part of like the actual championship, it's just boring. Um, Spa has kind of become on the same level where it's like I respect where it comes from and the the history of it and the evolution that it's gone through to get to where it is today but also the racing is generally like not great it's pretty it's all it's okay well the the track is so big that the 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 field just gets spread out after so after a few laps you know well right going into this race it's been kind of anyone's game for the world drivers championship kind of sort of it it was until ferrari's charles leclerc got into a whole lot of shenanigans mostly caused by the team oh uh that he could prior to this race have still technically caught up to red bulls max for Stappen, but he also had to worry about max's teammate sergio perez and we also had a whole ton of engine penalties that really shook things up so heading into this race before the belgian grand prix took place for had 258 points in the championship followed by Charles Leclerc with 178 and Sergio Perez right behind him with 173. I just don't see Ferrari catching Red Bull this season. I'm sorry, everyone. I know this is episode (laughs) three of the podcast, but I'm going to call it. It's a touchy subject. I think think (laughs) Max was so far ahead this weekend. The car was so good. Red Bull just has to do that every weekend and they'll be fine. It even seemed like they were under that much pressure, really. Anyway, the Constructors' Championship. How's that? How was that looking before this weekend? Oh, the Constructors' Championship is very, very similar to the Drivers' Championship. Basically, Ferrari could have done something, but 
they ruin every single race they start. So Red Bull is about 100 points ahead of Ferrari heading into this race weekend. Um, Mercedes is behind Ferrari because they're just not as fast. And the big competition is really among the best of the rest. You know, like we have our top three in Formula One, Mercedes, Red Bull and Ferrari. And then we have everybody else. Our big competition is back there. It's like Alpine and McLaren. They want to win best of the rest because that's almost as good as winning the championship, except not. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, last time we discussed that, you know, getting that fourth place position really gives you kind of momentum as long as you're moving upwards, right? As long as you're the midfield team moving upwards, like getting that fourth place finishing position, like that really gives you a lot of morale. Uh, you can easily you can sell that to sponsors. Be like, look, we're on an upper trajectory. We we can get a championship in the next five years. Like it it could happen. Uh, so I mean, it's just as important. And plus, you get that prize money too. It's a lot. You get a more prize money than the other teams. Thank you, Mister Captain Obvious. But uh, <laughs> just because you're not in the top three doesn't mean that you're going to stop fighting. So true. The grid order uh, for the start of the race was Signs, Perez, and Alonso. Um, that's right. Fernando Alonso up there in third place with the team that he's actually leaving. Uh, you had Yuki Tsunoda starting from the pits and Charles Leclerc started in 15th right behind Max. Um, and just a little, uh, a little note. Leclerc has never landed on the podium when he started beyond seventh place. So it wasn't looking too good for good old truck Leclerc. Uh, it never is Nolan. It is yeah. never looking very good for Chuck Leclerc. Considering this was the first race back from the summer break, a lot of teams had engine penalties or not engine penalties, but, you know, penalties related to engine repair, engine replacement, transmission, power unit, blah, blah, blah. Um, So we had eight drivers taking grid penalties, including Max Verstappen. That's why he started so far back. Verstappen was actually on pole and with Carlos Sainz recording the second fastest time, despite Ferrari's strategy of using Charles Leclerc for slipstreaming and almost going awry. Signs Carlos Signs recorded the second fastest time despite Ferrari's strategy of using Charles Leclerc for slipstreaming almost going awry when they put him on fresh tires apparently by mistake uh yeah big big Ferrari. mess up from Ferrari. Uh, Ferrari I could not believe it during the broadcast stupid you know but <laughs> we've already we've talked so much about Ferrari's mess ups on the past two episodes I think we can talk more honestly it's, um it happens. It happens all the time. OK, they continue so, to to mess up in even more confounding and fascinating ways with each race. And that's uh, enough no, reason to watch, I guess. Nolan, you got to tell me, um, what does Ferrari need to do? They need to pick it up, obviously. Uh, <laughs> they need to pick like, it up. Not, not just that. But like, I don't know. I'm, I'm almost numb to the they to need the to pick ups. up the correct tires and put the correct yeah. tires on. The car. <laughs> Tick it <laughs> up ferrari yeah man pick up the right tires so i actually didn't watch qualifying because um i had to find a vpn in order to watch anything because nothing was on tv in my hotel room so i missed qualifying all i did was log on and see quotes from charlotte claire saying what are these tires and then the team going sorry it's a mistake and i was like what (laughs) (laughs) what seems fine like I've now decided that every single time anything happens, my response is, sorry, it's a mistake. Because that's a little that's a little inside joke with me now. And just I'm gonna laugh so- at it. Yeah, it just doesn't feel like anyone is at the controls at Ferrari. Like I feel like there's a there's a management style or lack of where everyone just assumes that someone is in control and really nobody is. And that's how it feels. Yeah, well, t- they resorted to asking Charles to pick his own race strategy during the race. So <laughs> I can't wait to talk. It kind of makes that. sense. I can't kind of makes sense. I cannot wait to talk about that, but you know what? You know what? So we don't do a Ferrari episode again because we've done a bunch of Ferrari episodes already because Ferrari, uh, let's talk about the rest of the race and then we'll talk about Ferrari. Elizabeth, um, tell me what Max Verstappen did at the race this weekend. Uh, Max Verstappen was good. That was what he did. Ah, okay. He- okay. <laughs> He had a qualifying time that was nearly eight tenths of a second faster than anyone else and 1.8 seconds quicker than his biggest rival last year, Lewis Hamilton. Uh, Obviously, he was kicked back and started in 14th place because he took new engine components. Uh, But the first laps of the race were disgustingly good. 
Uh, by lap five, he was up to sixth place after starting 14th. Lap seven, up to fifth after he took DRS behind Fernando Alonso, then made his way up into fourth. By lap eight, he was in third. Uh, the, you got to note that the fourth, the first eight laps uh, were under a safety car, thanks to Ugh. a lot of collisions at the start of the race. That's disgusting. Which, d- yeah, it, it helped a little bit, helped Verstappen. He is astoundingly good on restarts, so getting those positions uh, worked really well for him. By <laughs> lap 11, Verstappen was right behind Sergio Perez. And then on lap 13, guess what? He hit the lead, and that's where he stayed for the rest of the race. That makes it his ninth victory of the season. And also with his teammate, Checo Perez, finishing just behind him, that is the 21st Red Bull 1-2 in Formula 1. It's mind-blowing, uh, especially considering that these cars are generally designed around one driver uh, with Red Bull. I, I would like to posit something that I heard from Ryan King on Twitter. Tell us more. He said that uh, these new regulations have made overtaking a lot easier, but overtaking does not necessarily make a good race because no one is reigning in the stratification with that, ha- it, it, you know, is currently between like, you know, which teams are good and which teams are bad, which is part of what made Verstappen's run so quick, like by lap 13 to 44, he was already at the front. Um, I thought it was pretty true. Like, it makes sense to me that Formula One was prioritizing overtaking because it looks cool and not actually prioritizing the the competition of getting cars closer together, actively competing against each other. Well, Hmm. so I think, yeah, there's a huge difference between overtaking and like good battles for position. So like Max Verstappen going, hey, um, Sergio Perez is holding me up. Can I pass him? That's technically an overtake. Um, So is DRS. DRS, which is Mm -hmm. your drag reduction system. You open up your rear wing when you're less than a second behind the car in front of you. Your drag reduction system gives you that huge boost of speed. That's an overtake, too. It's not always an exciting overtake, though, because the most exciting overtakes are often the ones that have a good battle with them. So, sure, it Mm -hmm. looks good on the statistics to have a bunch of overtakes, but were the overtakes actually exciting? Depends. You have to watch the race to find out. Mm -hmm. And an interesting stat that came from this race was that this was the first time a driver has gotten wins back to back after starting lower than 10th place. Uh, The last time that happened was in 1959 at the season ending race at the U.S. Grand Prix. Bruce McLaren pulled this off by then going into the first race of the 1960 season in Argentina and also winning from below 10th on the grid. Um, And the U.S. Grand Prix in 1959 was actually very fun. It was a mixed field of Formula One cars and Indy cars. Uh, They just decided that Americans were going to race with Formula One drivers, and they all did pretty bad. Wow, I would love to see that happen today. I think it would be quite fun. Um, (laughs) It would be great. I would enjoy tweeting about it. But, But we're not just going to talk about the good things that happened in this race. I think a very important thing that happened in this race was on the first lap, Lewis Hamilton and Fernando Alonso. They're going into the corner, right? And Lewis gets up next to Fernando, squeezes him so tight. They end up colliding. Lewis like flies into the air, kind of not like super high, but like high enough. Right. He bounces into the air, comes back down and he's pretty much like, that's it. That's He's done after that. Fernando Alonso on the radio says, What an idiot closing the door from the outside. I mean, we had a mega start, but this guy only knows how to drive and start him first. He hasn't done this actually very much at all this year, Fernando, but I, you know what? I respect your anger, sure. Lewis Hamilton, his car stops, he gets out of it, right? And I think a really wonderful thing about Formula One is just sometimes randomly they'll leave the drivers completely on their own to like just get back to the paddock. We saw this. uh, Was it Canada when Sergio Perez had something happen? Was it in Canada? Somebody tell me. I'm pretty sure it was Canada because it was like in the woods. Yeah. So (laughs) so his car stops and this is like during qualifying, I think. And he gets out and he has to walk through the woods 
to get back to the paddock <laughs> and he just has a camera fo person following him through the woods and the people on the broadcast are like oh yeah you know there are snakes out there <laughs> so sometimes they just let the drivers just walk back so that happened this time right everybody's racing around the track and lewis hamilton is walking on this lonely road the only one that he has ever known on the gravel um <laughs> and we get this wonderful shot of him just walking sadly on the gravel and then like 40 laps later we finally find lewis hamilton right like it's been a long time he must have walked like quite a few circles it's a, it's a four mile track like that he probably had to take his time yeah so it took forever before we even hear that like lewis hamilton is back at the paddock and they finally interview him and he's like yeah looking back at the footage uh, Fernando Alonso was in my blind spot. I didn't leave him enough space. It was my fault. I'm sorry to the team. And then he gets asked, like, they're introducing the question of Fernando Alonso called you stupid. And he stops the question before we get to that. And he goes, You only know how to. Sorry? It doesn't really matter what you said. Okay. I don't really care. Uh, like I said, that it was mine. It was my fault. I couldn't see him actually. So he was like right in my blind spot. <laughs> I would have liked to know about the view, you know, like how did it feel to reflect on life on this gravel trail? But we didn't get to hear about that. They never asked the important questions. Never. Listen, if I'm talking to Lewis Hamilton, I'm asking him about the walk. I'm asking him for like, you know, do you have like a Yelp review of it? Would you recommend it? Like, is it a good vacation spot? Nobody asked him. Did you keep your helmet on the whole time? He had his helmet on on the broadcast and like. That to me is so sad when they're like doing the sad boy walk with their helmet on. Oh, they yeah. don't even bother to take the helmet off. And, you know, like. Because, you know, they're like sad and they don't want people to see their they face. don't want people to see their face. Also, it's probably like good sunglasses, you know, like if I didn't have sunglasses, I don't know that I would want to take my helmet off. But I have a NASCAR helmet. I have Denny Hamlin's NASCAR helmet. Shout out to my buddy, Denny Hamlin. Um, It's so tight. <laughs> Like it squeezes your face so badly. And I think if I were to wreck my car, I would take that helmet off immediately. Right. But they just leave it I on. Can't, like when I even when I do go karting and it's like one of those generically sized helmets, like I can't wait to get that thing off my head. Yes. Ooh, exactly. Especially like, like he's got an all black race suit on. That's got to be miserable. Like, that man must be sweaty. He probably kept it on so that no one could see him look bad because he was sweating. Fair. Yeah, other than the uh, Hamilton Alonso incident, the rare mistake from Hamilton, uh, Alpine had a pretty great race. Esteban Ocon had a, a really nice double overtake on lap 36 against uh, Sebastian Vettel and Pierre Gasly. Ocon actually pulled a few double overtakes throughout this race, just showing his racecraft. I don't know if many people would be like, yeah, Esteban Ocon, that's my favorite dude ever. He, he reminds me of Albon a little bit. He's like Albon light a bit, like yeah, in terms of yeah. personality. He seems like a really good dude. Seems like a, a friendly dude, humble dude. Um, mm -hmm. Great driver. I just wish he was yeah. in a faster car. He's one car. of my underrated. Yeah. He's one of my underrated drivers. Absolutely. This year. You know, my one comment about Esteban Ocon is that I don't pay a lot of attention to him, but every single time I see one of his Formula One headshots, he looks like he plays basketball. And <laughs> I just, I mean that in a really like nice way. Like he's got like in his headshots, like he's got like some basketball swagger going on. Like I don't know what it is, but. He looks like he could Define dunk. basketball swagger. He looks like he could dunk, okay? Like if Is you it just because he's lanky? Well, yeah, he's lanky. And if you picture him <laughs> from the shoulders up, like he looks like we would get on a basketball court and like he would he would be very good at it, right? And good for him. Fernando also had a terrific race despite the spat with Hamilton. He finished in fifth place. Because Charles Leclerc got a five-second penalty for speeding oh, in the pit a whole lane. Thing. Yes, Ugh. um, it was also somewhat of a rough race for McLaren. Daniel Daniel was up in the top ten for a lot of the race, but uh, I did not realize it was because he was holding off on that pit stop for much of the race. Once he came into the pits, uh, he dropped down out of the points positions, unfortunately. No, and that is what we call an optical illusion, okay? You stay out of the pits, you look like you're running well, and you're actually not. And I Dude, think I was really like, lovely. hell yeah, like, <laughs> Danny Rick just got let go. This is the first, first race weekend after being let go, and he's kick, kicking ass. I was like, this is sick. Daniel's going to be, Daniel's back. Uh, no, no, it was, it was no. the pit illusion, like you said. 
It was the pit illusion. Anyway, Alex Albon, he's having a great time, right? So aside from his his social media, his like commenting on George Russell's shirtless photos, his memeing of the Oscar Piastri thing, like aside from all that, he has a seat with Williams until at least 2024, which was announced over the summer break. And he also scored some points at Spa, right? So he was in 10th. It was a really tough job to keep that 10th place. Like everybody behind him had about a second between each other. They were all real close and he did it. He scored points. Mm -hmm. That's our guy. The guy with all the cats. We appreciate you. I was really stoked for Alex this weekend Uh, near the end of the race. It looked like Lance Stroll. He was within a second range of Alex in those closing laps. And I was I was uh, worried that Stroll was going to get that DRS and pass him on one of those longer straights, but luckily Alex held on. And uh, for me, that was kind of the highlight, not the, that was one of my highlights for this race was seeing Alex Albon get his, his third points finish of the season. Yeah, it was wonderful. And um, speaking of highlights and lowlights, um, I think everybody knows who a low light is and a low light is always Ferrari. Um, wow. Ferrari was out there. They ran a race. They sure did. They sure did. Um, <laughs> at one point, at one point during the race, they radio Charlotte Claire and they go, hey, buddy, um, we're targeting a P5 finish. Is that all right? Question. And <laughs> I just <laughs> they keep asking him questions and they end every question with question. And it just made it worse. It made it worse. Like, yeah. And then they, they just start asking him to determine strategy. They're like, OK, Charles, what are we doing? Question. What, what tires do you it's want? It's just not Question. confidence inspiring, you know, for a driver to, to be in that position. No, exactly. I, I feel like the tone amply conveyed that it was a question, but I feel like the fact that, that any of that was even being asked was not great. Sh- should you not already have the information you need to make these calls? Like, do you have to be asking the driver specifically if this is okay? Like, you, you should know. You should have this, like every possible strategy mapped out and not asking Charles Leclerc a question. I felt physical pain when they kept asking him to determine strategy while racing the car. It's like, uh, (laughs) Hey, we kind of ran out of ideas. Um, So you do you, man. Like we're chilling here. You just have a good time. Have a good time in that car. We'll see you when the race is over. It's everything's chill. Everything's actually not chill. Um, far from chill. And so um, at the very end of the race, it was very it was obvious that Charlotte Claire was not in contention. Like here they are with this really fast car, this really good driver. And they're not even like a podium is not even on their mind. They're like, we're going to finish fifth, my guy. And it's like, who's finishing in front of you? Like, how are you in fifth? What? And so they basically are like, yeah, we're going to finish fifth. Fernando Alonso is behind Charles Leclerc. And a very common strategy in Formula One is if you're in the top 10 and you have enough of a time gap between yourself and the car in the position behind you, you will take a pit stop at the end of the race, put on soft, new soft tires and try to get a fastest lap point. That is only if you have enough seconds between you and the car behind you to pit and come out of the pits with a safe distance behind you. That car is still behind you. They bring in Charles Leclerc at the end of the race, like three laps to go. That's obviously the idea here, except he comes out of the pits, even with Fernando Alonso in sixth. like there was not there was not the time gap, right? And he has to and he ends up battling Fernando Alonso for position. And it's just like he's fighting for his life out here against Fernando Alonso, the guy who never retires, the guy who is not in a Ferrari, like the guy who does not have the car to be battling Charles Leclerc for fifth. And he ends up passing Fernando Alonso, does not get fastest lap and crossing the line in fifth. But he sped on pit lane. And this just like ill-advised strategy that should not have happened in the first place introduced an extra element speeding in pit lane that gave Charles Leclerc a five second penalty and put him behind Fernando Alonso, the position he fought so hard to get. And I'm just like, this is Ferrari right here. And at the end of the race, 
Fernando Alonso was asked about it. And Fernando says, when Charles came into box for fastest lap. Yeah, I was surprised, but Ferrari always does some strange strategy, so. <laughs> <laughs> and I saw this, and I'm just like, you know Fernando Alonso does not sit on Twitter and just like, just absorb all the Ferrari memes. And yet he creates this really lovely Ferrari meme, which is Ferrari always does strange strategies. <laughs> How sad. It was beautiful. I feel like Ferrari's weekend was summed up. So I watch the races and qualifying on F1 TV. And one of the commentators was like, Oh, the Ferraris are fastest on like this sector and Red Bull's quickest on this one. And then they like, paused for a second and they were like all right well actually ferrari's only faster on two corners and red bull's fastest on the rest of the track i was like that is that is gonna set the tone for this weekend oh that's horrific so i actually think um in the spirit of in the spirit of ferrari asking Charles leclerc every single question they possibly could like Charles leclerc is our new medium he's our new psychic we are going to visit him at the local psychic. <laughs> what do you ask him? You must start the question oh. with Charles and you must end the question with question and he will answer it. What are you asking him? Oh, man. Oh, that's a good one. oh this is me paying for parking at one of those automated parking uh, things. <laughs> OK, Charles, it's Nolan. What's my license plate number? It's 10 feet away. I, I don't want to go walk back. Question. Amazing. Wow, Nolan. Thank you so much. Yeah. That's great. Oh, that's that's incredible. That's fantastic. Um, okay, I've got mine. So for context, my mother forgets every single password she's ever set in her life. Okay. <laughs> I am going to forward my question to my mother. I'm going to give her the opportunity oh to ask our psychic, Charles Leclerc, Leclerc, a question. And her question every single time will be, Charles? It's Jody. What is my password to this account? Question. <laughs> I'm forwarding it along because I am I'm selfless. She needs it more than you do. She needs it more than I do. Right. She needs to ask him. So that's it. Elizabeth, what are you asking our guy, Charles Leclerc? Charles, I haven't decided on dinner for the past week. <laughs> what am I having for dinner tonight? Question. <laughs> OK, my guy, please get back to us. We appreciate you listening to the podcast. We hope you like it. Do you like it? Question. Thank you. Question. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Our top three was Max Verstappen, who got the trifecta of driver of the day and also fastest lap. He was followed by his teammate Sergio Perez in second. And rounding out the podium was Ferrari's Carlos Sainz in third. Not Ferrari Charles Leclerc. No. Nope. Question. Not a question. <laughs> Not statement <laughs> statement uh, <laughs> some other interesting uh tidbits from this race is gas is a uh, pierre gasly's 100th f1 race wow he's been on this for a long time that's crazy i remember when he was announced like i wrote a story about it for red bull when he was announced i actually i have a great pierre gasly story if you all want to is it, it better than mine though oh boy I don't know. It might be up there. Battle of the there. Pierre Gasly stories. You first, me second. <laughs> so in 2015, the U.S. Grand Prix rained out uh, qualifying, and I was standing in line waiting for a shuttle bus back to downtown Austin. So I do what I do at most racetracks. I get on Tinder. I shrink the the size of the the area to one mile, and I see which race car drivers are on it. Oh, Pierre my, are you joking, Elizabeth? No, no, Elizabeth. You you learn so much about how they describe themselves in their profile, Elizabeth. Um, <laughs> Elizabeth. I learned. I learned. So Pierre Gasly and I are the same age. We were both born in 1996. I learned that he was posing as a 21 year old on tinder what? and he was 19 what? oh what? yep yep <laughs> was yep. he using his was he using his actual name yeah it was pierre gasly it was his his profile photo was the exact same one that he was using on like every social media was he verified on tinder uh i don't know if he was very i don't think that was a thing then oh that like, wasn't a thing was, then no i think but it was definitely like 
it linked to all of the right places. Was, and... um, was he like holding a fish? Was that oh, one of his no. pictures? Fish. Yeah. He was shirtless on a boat. He was sure. He oh, okay. So he's shirtless. <laughs> he's holding a fish. He's at the gym doing a, a, a bicep curl. Oh, my. That's okay. But what does his profile say? I can't remember. Um, I don't remember his. I remember Connor Daly from IndyCar was there. And all I remember was that it, all his bio said was American race car driver. Oh, my God. But that's actually <laughs> that it. like that. Actually, that's exactly what his bio would say, though. It, like, yeah, it was perfect. It was so funny. There are so many things that Connor Daly could write on a dating app profile, including the fact that he spends all of his time watching alien documentaries. What? Like, correct. yeah. Oh, yeah. OK, Nolan, all the okay. IndyCar drivers. We're friends. He and I got to be friends now. <laughs> OK, Nolan, all the IndyCar drivers are into aliens. And I think it like I think the origin what? of this is Connor Daly. Like, I think he started it. But all I thought of the it was Indi- Sage Karam. Oh, no, it's Sage Karam. Sage Karam. The, yeah. yeah so sage Karam is where it starts and they're all into aliens they all like want to be abducted like they watch alien documentaries hell yeah like, dude hell yeah hell and then, yeah and so connor daly <laughs> and sage Karam, they will come and talk to me on twitter spaces on tuesday nights and they'll be like like connor will come to twitter spaces while his alien documentary is at commercial <laughs> And then as soon as it's back from commercial, he leaves like no That's warning so commercials over. I got to get back to my alien documentary. And I'm just like, this is the weirdest thing that regularly occurs in my That's life. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. So anyway, aliens, um, we got there from dating apps, which is pretty impressive. My Pierre Gasly story is, in fact, I have a thing where when I talk to race car drivers, I ask them to tell me how hot Chris Angel is on a scale from one to ten. Mm hmm. And I was one time at an event where Pierre Gasly was and I went up to his PR handlers and I said, I've got a really weird question. Am I allowed to ask him? And they were like, nothing's off limits. Go ahead. And I was like, don't say that. (laughs) (laughs) Don't say that. That's not a good plan. And so I said, "Okay." so I go up to this table that he's at. Right. And I kneel down at the table so that we are on eye level, right? I don't want to be looking down at him. We need to be on eye level, same level as each other for this question. And everybody sees me kneel down at this table and they know about the Chris Angel question. And they're like, oh, oh, she's in the Chris Angel question asking position. Like, (laughs) and so everyone swarms the table to, to witness it, right? Gets their phones out and starts recording and taking photos and stuff like that. And so I sit down and I go, all right, Pierre, I have a question. I ask everyone this. We have a spreadsheet where we track it and I just need you to answer. And I get my phone out and I say, on a scale from one to 10, how attractive is Chris Angel? And he's like, I don't know who that is. And I was like, that's fine. That's fine. So I pull up some photos of Chris Angel. (laughs) He's sitting here looking at these photos and he goes, I like girls. I don't like boys. And I was like, that's not the question, Pierre. And he goes, are you asking me if I'm a girl? And I was like, sure, Pierre, <laughs> you're a girl. Um, how attractive is Chris Angel? And he goes, I'm not a girl. And I was like, you just set me up to fail okay. in that question. Like, <laughs> if you're like going to be so defensive about an- answering it, maybe it's a cultural thing. I don't know. But like, just answer the question. Just answer the question. Exactly. You but know, you like, know what? Ca- just cause, like, look, I'm going to say Chris Angel. No offense, uh, Alanis. Rude. I'm going to say rude. like, I'm going to say five. He's not my type. That's better than some of the ratings I get, Nolan. Thank you so much. Yeah. So I answered. That doesn't mean that I'm in love with Chris Angel. No, it means that you can objectively rate someone on a scale of one to ten. Yes. Right. Pierre, I'm going to sit here until I get a number. <laughs> and so I start going through all these photos and he goes, ah, uh, he's he's good looking. And I'm like, okay, okay, thank you. Are we talking like a seven, an eight? <laughs> and he's like, yeah, seven, eight. And I go, eight. Okay, thank you so much. And I get up and I just walk off. <laughs> and I was informed that um, his mother got wind of it and his mother thought it was very funny. And so did his entire PR team. Um, this is just what I was told. His mother has not told me that she thought it was really funny, but she was my boyfriend of the week the other week. So yes. Pascal Gasly, Pascal you're my girl. Gasly. Elizabeth just sent us the photo of Pierre Gasly's <laughs> Tinder. Wow, this is a much younger, more innocent Pierre Gasly. Yes. Because he was 19. He was 19. And you know what? That's very relatable. Uh, 
make, this makes it more relatable because this is not a very flattering photo, I would say. Not at up here. all. It it's makes a, his face look kind of weird. Uh, yeah. But you know what? When I was 19 years old, my dating profiles were also that bad, um, if not worse. <laughs> Uh, so this gives me hope. That's so funny that he said he was 21 too, but it, that was also based off like your Facebook profile too. So like maybe he made a face, a Facebook when he was like 13 or something or whatever, and said he was older than he was. So maybe that's not like a dating ploy. Maybe that's just like yeah. circumstance, but that is hilarious. It, it, it was so funny. I'm looking at this photo and this man is like standing on the back of a boat and one of his friends is like water skiing. And it's just yeah. like a selfie of him in that like really bluish Instagram filter from back in the day, if you remember what I'm talking about. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah, that really bluish Instagram filter that like upped a lot of the contrast and like gave everything a blue tint. And he's just like smiling at the camera while his friend is on a water ski. And you know what? I respect this a lot. Good for him. Elizabeth, do you just like swipe through these people and like see where they're at or like what do you do? Do you does like Pierre Gasly come up and you hit the X mark because you don't actually want to match with this guy? You just want to like creep on him. I usually would swipe right because I was also 19 and was trying to see what I could what I could do. Um, oh, my yeah. God. It was, it was mostly just like I wanted to see. <laughs> I just wanted to see what they would say about themselves. And like I wanted to see who is actively like hunting for ass. Oh, my God. <laughs> This is Whoa. actually like one of the most fascinating experiences <laughs> I've ever had. And like, I actually cannot handle this. Oh my God. It's pretty good. It was pretty good. Oh, yeah. Elizabeth, Elizabeth, <laughs> Elizabeth. Speaking of boyfriend of the week. Is it time for it boyfriend time. of the week? It is time for boyfriend of the week. <laughs> Boyfriend of the Week is our reoccurring segment where we acknowledge who is the best. It can be anybody. It can be a driver, a car, a moment, team lead, whatever. A Redditor we even had a few weeks ago. Oh, uh, you yeah, get the we picture. did. So uh, this, is, uh, this is middle school rules. This is for the week only. No husbands. Uh, uh, Alanis, how about you lead us off? Oh, I get to go first. This is so exciting because mine is probably everyone's this week. I've got to refer to Instagram for mine. And in case we didn't know, it was recently Valtteri Botas's birthday. All right. Recently, our guy's birthday. This is our poster boy. And Tiffany Cromwell, who is with who is Valtteri's partner, Tiffany Cromwell, posts a photo album on Instagram of Valtteri to wish him happy birthday. And you just go to Tiffany's Instagram, open this photo album. It's like eight photos or so. And you scroll all the way to the right. And if you you are rewarded if you scroll all the way to the right. You are rewarded with your perseverance and your dedication to the cause with a photo of Valtteri in a sun chair, completely naked with his hands over his crotch. Yep. And that to me is really that's dedication to the bit. And I have decided that within the next three months, I think we will have all seen Valtteri Botas completely naked. Um, I think he's committed to being <laughs> naked. I think we are just getting like progressively worse with these photos and we will eventually get that. That is my boyfriend of the week. Yeah. I mean, I think uh, Valtteri Botas, definitely one of the cooler drivers out there, I think, in terms of, of, of temperament. And, you know, just like little glimpses of this into his life. Little glimpses of his entire it, it, it naked speaks body. To it, it speaks to his, ter <laughs> his, his character. You know, he doesn't take himself too seriously. Um, no. Which I really admire. I think that's I, cool. I agree. That is my boyfriend of the week. Sorry to Tiffany Cromwell. Liz. I am going old school with my. Uh-oh. Uh, I am picking Jackie Ix. Oh, my God. Was a, he was <laughs> a guest of Ferrari this weekend. Oh. Um, he is 77 years old and a beautiful silver fox. Um, I'll give you he's that. A former, he's a former Formula One driver, killed it at Le Mans, also killed a lot of people. <laughs> oh, my he's, God. He's, I think he was involved in more fatal wrecks than anyone else in motorsport Elizabeth, history. That was really that was quite a transition. Killed it at <laughs> Le Mans, also killed a lot of people. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. No, like, like, did you yeah, write that? Involved. Did you write that down before the episode? <laughs> no, I just think about it a lot. That's horrific. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I counted once and it was like five to seven accidents that Jackie X was involved in that ultimately ended up killing someone. Jeez. 
but I love him no matter what. He's well, great. He go. just posts photos of himself uh, on Instagram, which he recently got. And I am trying to build up the courage to slide into his DMs. <laughs> Elizabeth, I think you can do it. He's got 32,000 followers on Instagram. No, I feel like many. he's on there a lot. Like, you could do it. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and do it. Anyway, he's my boyfriend of the week. Nolan, awesome. what do you have? Uh, man, I, so many different uh, options um, going through my head right now. I think I'm going to go with Fernando Alonso. Wow. Uh, you know, okay. Yeah. That's a bold choice. That's controversial. You know, he's just a lovable curmudgeon who is not afraid to burn bridges. <laughs> <laughs> he burns every single bridge he and, possibly can. And we love him for it. And I think that's all I really need to say about that. Fernando Alonso, two-time world champ. We're going to see where he goes. Hopefully, it's a- another team. Hopefully, wow. he stays in it. Yep. Hopefully, it's another team. <laughs> oh, my God. Did you hear his great quote the other day where he said he's here to kill the strengths of his competition? Yes. It's so That's good. Insane. Just imagine saying that out loud and like being for realsies about it and also having like no one bad an eye because it's just who you it's are. It's just who you are. And you know what? I respect that. I respect that. That guy is like. He's like a really angry pet that you still like, right? Give us his astrology, Elizabeth, please. All right, Alonzo. So I spent my summer break also tabulating the astrological signs of every single Formula One. That's horrific. I never would. (laughs) Answered a Grand Prix. That's horrific. With like 1,200 people. Fernando Alonso is a Leo, which I think surprises absolutely no No one. one. Like he's got the fiery, cocky attitude and... All of that nonsense. So it, it only makes sense. This is who he was destined to be. He literally looks the part. He looks like a lion. Yes, he does. Like it, that one, I think, was the least shocking out of all of the people I tabulated. I was just like, yeah, absolutely. If I could have picked a sign for him, that's exactly what I would he do- I mean, like he does look like a lion. Like he's got the hair. He's got the mm-hmm. everything. Like he's he's pretty ornery. Like... I've got nothing else to say. Wow. Um, Thank you so much for listening to the Donut Racing Show. If you liked the episode, how do you do? How do you swipe on the dating apps? Do you swipe right? If you want to swipe right on the episode, is that how it works? Um, Please, please subscribe. Leave us a review. Maybe we will read it on air, just like we will racing drivers dating profiles. We have this one from our dear friend, Not Pepper. It is a perfect mix of silly and facts, stuff for casuals and stuff for hardcores. Best F1 podcast out right now. They've ruined any chances they had at landing a Ferrari driver as a guest, but I doubt they'd be able to figure out a Zoom call anyways. <laughs> Fire Bonotto and hire these three. Thank you so much, dear friend. We appreciate you listening. We will swipe right on you too. It is totally a match. Yay. Next episode, we'll be covering the Dutch Grand Prix of Zandvoort, which is the home race of Max Verstappen, who is currently leading the championship. Will Charles Leclerc ever catch up to the new second place championship leader, Sergio Perez? Can McLaren beat Alpine for fourth in the Constructors Championship? Will Nicholas Latifi keep spinning and spinning and spinning and spinning and spinning? (laughs) Find out next time on the Donut Racing Show. If you're not familiar with Donut Media, we have a YouTube channel. Check it out on YouTube, as well as an automotive history podcast called Past Gas. Check that out anywhere you get your podcasts. Follow Alanis at Alanis N. King on Twitter and Instagram. Follow Liz wow. at Eliz underscore Blackstock on Twitter and Eliza Blackstock on Instagram. You should be able to find and uh, find me at Nolan J. Sykes on all social media. Uh, thank you very much. Be kind. See you next time. Bye.